Meanwhile, back on the chessboard, let's check in to round five of the Sinkfield Cup and the game between Lenier Dominguez and Hans Niemann. So Dominguez, formerly from Cuba, now represents United States, resident in the United States. Very, very experienced indeed. 38 years old. He's been over 2,700 for, well, for, for years. So a tough competitor for Hans Niemann, uh, the man at the center of the storm. And it must be so difficult for Niemann to concentrate on playing. I mean, really? Uh, well, let's see what happened. Uh, it starts off as a Gioco Piano. No engagement between the two sides so far. And that means basically, you know, no exchanges. The struggle is deferred to later on in the game. And it's basically a very tense opening where both sides are just kind of feeling their way through. It's very subtle indeed. Rookie one. And this knight begins its traditional swing over to uh, the, the king side. And here's a, here's a very interesting moment already, actually. If white were to push forward with d4, I mean, generally, that's what you want to do with white. You want to gain space. In fact, in this position, the knight comes back to c6. And this almost forces an exchange or forces this pawn to go forward. And that's not what white wants at all. You want to hold the tension. I mean, normally knight f1 would be the move to protect here, but here comes a little trick. Black exchanges, and then you take on e4, this absolutely typical idea, the typical little tactic. So if rook takes, then d5 gets the piece back and black has won the two bishops. It's very, very nice. Of course, white can take on f7, but, well, you can see that in this position, materials even, but black has the two bishops. And in fact, black's pieces are very active. Whoops, that was a misfire. Black's pieces are very active in this position. So it, it's really subtle, this, this phase of the game. Bishop b3, and that, that bishop steps back to try and get out of those kind of tactics. And previously, there have been quite a few games with knight g6, but then d4, and, and white is certainly slightly better there. It's just a nice little space advantage. So, uh, Niemann played c5, and this is a new move, and it looks a little bit unusual to block in that bishop. Um, he said after the game that this was preparation. Um, but he was also said that he wished he'd prepared it a little bit better. Because the game didn't go that smoothly for black. I mean, the point of c5 is to challenge white in the centre, really. It's just to claim space and prevent white from pushing with d4. Downside is that it does weaken the d5 square, but at the moment that is pretty well covered. So it gains gains space on the queen side. Knight f1, the knight ducks back. Bishop b6, good to counter that bishop and also cover d5. Knight e3, good move. So that knight is such a key piece in the position. Looks at those wonderful squares. And here, you know, I was wondering whether whether black sh should just keep going with this strategy and, and gain some space on the queen side. But Niemann played queen d7. Okay, it's, it looks reasonable. I mean, black has um, pretty good coordination. The only piece that does look a little bit strange is that bishop on a7. But, well, that can come into the game. Bishop d2, rook d8, and a5. Now here is where position starts to look very nice for white, actually. This pawn cramps the b7 and a6 pawns. And yeah, that's a little bit uncomfortable. Um, here knight g6 
looks like the right idea to at least you know have the idea at some moment of perhaps putting that knight on f4 um, and and actually keeping the bishop on a7 because there are some circumstances some circumstances when the position can open as we're, we're going to see instead Niemann put the bishop on b8 now I think I understand what he's trying to do he's basically covering that pawn on e5 so that perhaps it might be possible to play d5 at some moment but here is where Dominguez takes control of the position does so in a really nice way and this just cuts across any ideas that black has first of all bishop a4 attacks the queen and now c4 obviously just clamps black in the middle so d5 is out of the question makes that bishop look pretty silly on b8 knight g6 and here again is where Dominguez really takes the game by the scruff of the neck. Knight d5, excellent move. That uh, has to be exchanged off. You don't want to give up your beautiful light squared bishop. I mean, that would mean that black would really have no counter chances on, on the king side. So knight takes, c takes, and the bishop has to drop back to d7. And you can see that after b4 well white has a wonderful space advantage on the queen side and it looks like a kind of king's indian actually with this these fixed structures in the middle but this is a very favorable king's indian where black just doesn't have counterplay on the king side there's nothing to balance this space advantage and this initiative on the queen side and basically White wants to get through to the pawns on b7 and d6. Those are the weak pawns. You can see that if the bishop had been on a7, then this would be a very different situation. I don't think White would go for b4 because that bishop would immediately be on that really beautiful diagonal. And, and, and Black, with the bishop on a7, then Black can even contemplate moves like bishop takes h3. Here it's just not working. Black doesn't have enough pieces. Uh, rook e3 followed by knight h2 or, or queen f1 and, and this attack comes to nothing. But imagine this position with the bishop on a7 just slashing down to the king side. Now that would be a serious attack but not here. There is no kingside counterplay. Niemann exchanged or took on b4. And there's actually no need for white to take on b4. Rook c1 is an excellent move. I mean, you notice all these moves. White is just punching away and black is reacting. Black just, yeah, ha has to exchange, has to keep defending. And white is making fantastic progress. So an exchange of bishops, remember, rook takes queen, then bishop takes queen. So queen takes bishop, and the queen only has one square, queen d7. And Dominguez, I'm sure, was delighted to exchange queens because now he never has to worry about his king, and he can just concentrate on attacking on the queen side. And again, it's about those two weak pawns, and you can see... White has this wonderful space advantage. So he's played rook c4 instead of taking with the bishop. He can decide in a moment whether he wants to recapture that pawn with either the rook or the bishop, or perhaps even swing rook number two over and capture that way. It's another option. But that pawn is dead. <laughs> That's not long for this world. Bishop a7, well, that bishop has to be activated and it's on a really nice diagonal. And Dominguez plays very pragmatically. Just chop off that active piece. Good move, bishop e3. Bishop takes and f takes, very nice. Means the knight is not going to be able to hop into f4. 
And again, the coast is almost clear for white to attack those pawns on b7 and d6. And notice how that rook on c4 controls the open file. So black has absolutely zero counterplay in its position. And this is looking really very poor for black. f5. So Niemann hits out. He's trying to generate some play. But it doesn't really improve matters, actually. An exchange of pawns and rook b1. There's absolutely nothing for white to fear on the king side. Rook f7, the rook has to come back to defend. Knight d2, that knight might be swinging into e4. It depends how black plays. The knight comes back to e7, attacking the pawn d5. So, well, in the end, white closes the position anyway with e4. But, you know, this is actually a very healthy pawn structure. The fact that these pawns on the d-file are doubled makes no difference at all. It's a strong structure. And the crucial thing here, it's those weak pawns, it's the control of the open file. King f8, king shuffles over. Could play, well, either rook recapture is good here, but rook c takes b4, attacking b7, and the knight comes back. So now the rook, rooks defend on the, on the second rank. Uh, knight f3, the knight comes back again. So, so why has the knight come back? Well, it's, it's all about that pawn break. So, in fact, those double pawns, it really doesn't mean anything. Um, you know, white has this really strong pawn break that's going to open up the position. Black is very passive, but knight a7, at least that knight can look perhaps to get to b5 to block out the b5. But in the meantime, d4, very powerful. So the e5 pawn is attacked. Black can't, well, it, it, it's not very pleasant to, to defend that pawn. So that's exchanged off. The knight looking fantastic on d4, looking at all these wonderful squares, in particular e6. And yes, I'm going to say it, it's looking like an octopus knight. There we are. I can see it there. g6 covering the f5 square. Rook b3, that's perhaps looking to swing across on the third rank. King g7. H4, this is very nice, that just cramps the king side. There's no particular rush at the moment. Knight b5. Here is the crunch moment in the game. So they're at move 36, they're approaching the time control. How would you play as white in this position? I'm going to have a quick slurp of beautiful Barry's tea and... Um, Cheers, folks. You have a little think. White play. What would you do here? Good stuff. Here, Dominguez lost his nerve. He exchanged the knight on b5. You got to keep your octopus. It's all about the octopus. This is a fantastic piece. Now, I understand why Dominguez was reluctant to play the knight in here because it leaves black's knight on b5, blocking out the rooks. But in fact, that knight on b5 isn't really going anywhere and it's play switches once you put that knight on e6. And what a beast! It covers these squares. Now notice, it really restricts those two black rooks. They can't get to the open file. They can't go back to the eighth rank and starts to hassle the king. Let me just show you a couple of lines. Now, this is not yet winning, but it's, well, it's on, it's on the right track. Let's have a look. So if king f6, rook f3 check, this is a nice trick. The king would love to come to e5, but then knight f8. Ooh, 
black has to give something up because um, well it, it's actually going to be checkmate very soon in this position um, apart from winning material so that's no good um, what about if the king goes back rook c4 important move the rooks aren't doing anything on the b file but just claim the c file and this is terrible so rook c8 threatened the knight hops back to cover the c8 square and now well what can black do in this position actually nothing let's just play the king forward I mean, black, you can see that knight completely dominates the rooks. I mean, it is, if I was going to show you a, a good example of what an octopus knight does and how it can dominate major pieces, then this is a great example. It's just a pity there isn't a black queen to dominate as well, but two rooks, pretty good. And white just brings the king up the board, and sooner or later... White is going to be able to force an exchange of rooks here. Um, I mean, for example, this rook might come around here and, and force an exchange of rooks. I mean, it's, it's just a glorious position. I'll show you another variation where this ex ex exchange of rooks comes in. So let's say black waits with king h7. Rook c4, again, claiming the open file. I know I'm going into a lot of detail here. This didn't happen, I should repeat, but it, I think it's interesting to see how white can actually squeeze black from this position and make progress. You can see that, well, all black's pieces are passive here. The knight has to come back to stop the rook invading with rook c8. Black can only wait. The king comes up. First things first, before you think about doing anything, let's just put the king in the middle. Gets it off the back rank. It can support those center pawns. Black waits. Rook c2. King back. Rook d7. Rook c1. Rook f1, excuse me. Now, finally, white is ready to do something. The rook can come into f6. And once it's on f6, then you can see that, well, the g6 pawn will probably be dropping. You could even preface this with g4, g5, but well, actually, yeah, just putting the rook, rook on f6 could be fatal for black already. So finally, black is forced to exchange on f3, and this is what white wants. Now you can see white has this fantastic central pawn chain. Because of the knight on e6, black still can't get any counterplay by moving the rook to the c-file. White can always put the rook back on c1 just to completely paralyze black's pieces. It means the knight can't move, otherwise the rook would invade. Uh, and white can slowly advance with the f-pawn. Uh, there's even the possibility sometimes just to play h5 and then scoop up that h-pawn and then advance in the middle with this wonderful central pawn majority supported by the king. I mean, I think basically this is a strategically winning position. And it shows, well, not just the power of the knight, but it's that central space advantage and the space advantage on the queen side as well. Just a glorious position. I think, well, you know, if Dominguez had been able to reflect a little longer, I think, you know, he would have gone for this. He, he's, he's a consummate positional player. So it's kind of surprising that he lost his nerve and instead took the knight on b5. He obviously just thought, ah, oh, it looks too strong. I need to take it off. But actually after this, there's a problem. If that pawn is taken, the king strides out into the middle and then it is safe on e5. And actually black has good counterplay. So Dominguez declined to take on b5, instead played rook f3. Well, again, if those rooks are exchanged, then um, this would give white a wonderful position. But no, black doesn't need to do that. Rook e7. Just a little bit of pressure here. So white's king hurries into the middle to defend this pawn. Otherwise, it just won't be possible to take on b5. Rook c7. Black gains counterplay. What a difference it makes once the rook activates. 
and this it's like breakout in those those old um, you know those very early computer games you know once one piece breaks out and starts hassling around the back uh, there's yeah I mean white simply can't use the initiative can't use that space advantage and here well of course you don't exchange rooks you keep active that means that you can always hassle along here hassle all those pawns certainly not possible to take here because of the check and you take here and um, this this is absolutely fine for black so the game ended like this king d3 and now a check and black keeps tabs on that pawn and Dominguez just blocked it out and they repeated moves. I mean, there really is nothing that white can achieve in this position so long as black maintains that active rook. So a draw. Very interesting games. I think strategically highly complex. I think Dominguez played really, I would say, almost perfectly up until move 37. Chess is a difficult game. You play such a good game and then you throw it away with one move. Shame for him. Hans Niemann, well, he defended as well as he could. And, uh, you know, he, he got that draw in the end. Really interesting. After the game, Hans Niemann sat down uh, and was interviewed by Alejandro uh, Ramirez in St. Louis and that is a fascinating interview. He talked a little bit about the game but he talked more about the whole situation that he's in at the moment and I would highly recommend it. Um, he looked like a man who had a lot to get off his chest and he spoke with passion and uh, I would highly recommend it. I will put the link to that interview uh, in in the comments, uh, so you you can I, please please do take a look at it. Good, you've got to see it. It's a free day on Wednesday in St Louis, but they'll be resuming action on Thursday, and I'll be reporting um, reporting back on events there. Anyway, thanks for watching.